afternoon and welcome to Carlham Cymru session, sessions. This session will focus on Physics A2 Year 13 and will be presented by Mr Ridd from Cunveig School in Bridgend. The session will last around 45 minutes where the teacher will go through the relevant subject content. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer section and we will endeavour to answer your question during the session. The session will be recorded and the recording with any relevant resources will be uploaded to the ISCOL website in the Kalam Kamru area. And without much further ado, I allow Mr. Rith to continue. Uh, hi there. Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction. Today we're going to be going through A2 physics gravitational fields. So I'll get on straight into it. Now, uh, gravitational fields is a part of the Unit 4 course and it leads on to orbits in the wider universe. Now, um, essentially, I, I put this little slide there because I, I quite like it. I show it to my own students. Um, you can almost think of this as an overview of physics in a way. Um, what is physics about? Well, it's about the particles uh, and the forces that, that govern them. And um, really, you see in the four forces there, the strong force, electromagnetic force, electromagnetic force, the weak force and the gravitational force and the particles they act on. Now, um, we are still, as physicists, uh, at a bit of a loss to how gravity fits into um, the standard model and a lot of physics. And it's quite remarkable that gravity kind of exists on its own in a way. And any person or any physicist that can manage to unify gravity and bring it into the, the sphere of what we know about physics uh, would certainly be one of the most famous physicists of this generation or this century. So maybe that's something one of you guys could do and then obviously just give me an acknowledgement when you achieve that. Um, so the specification then, um, we're going to start with uh, gravitational field strength. OK, this one here, gravitational field strength. Uh, G is force per unit mass on a small test mass placed at the point, OK? Now, it would be remiss of me to talk about gravity without mentioning Newton. Before we get to um, gravitational field strength, I think you've got to just have an appreciation of what a remarkable discovery the theory of gravitation is. Because up until the point when Newton helped us to understand gravity, it was just always assumed that things fall down. Things just fall down. That's just the way it is. It's the way it has always been. But I think a sign of true genius is to be able to solve a problem that no one even knows exists. And that's what Newton did because he realized that, in fact, things falling down on Earth happen because objects were in a gravitational field. And in fact, out there in the cosmos, in the, in the chasm of space, that isn't what objects in fact do. And the natural state of an object is to continue doing what it always does. So it's a, it's a pretty incredible discovery. Eight, be grateful, all right, that you only had, uh, what was that, one minute on Newton? If you'd been in my class, it could have been more like half hour. So um, moving on then, so gravitational field strength. If you remember from key stage four, from key stage four, you had this formula, W is equal to mg. And I, I suppose we're going to be expanding on that now and taking it one step further. Um, so what does, what does that mean? Well, we know that um, G then is measured in newtons per kilogram. And so much of what we need to know about it is just locked up in that unit of measurement. It tells us the force acting per unit mass. Now, in most cases, that will be a kilogram, the force acting per unit mass. Um, now, you know, or you might recall from uh, last year that on Earth, G is 10 newtons per kilogram. Um, it, at A level now, you'll already be familiar with the fact that actually that's more like G is equal to 9.81 newtons per kilogram. And what that essentially means is that if I have a one kilogram object on the Earth's surface, it will have a weight equal to 9.81 newtons. Um, 
However, and this is where the A level part kicks in now, because if I think about um, a mass out here, like this guy, for example, that is quite a considerable distance away from the Earth's surface. And at this point, we have to appreciate that that distance away from the Earth's surface is going to reduce the gravitational field strength. Another point which um, you know, I'd like to uh, make as well is that gravitational fields on their own aren't easy to even conceptualize. In fact, you can only feel the presence of a gravitational field if you place an object within it. So it's meaningless in some ways to talk about the gravitational field at the point in the room without contextualizing it in terms of how much force it would exert upon a mass. And you only see the effect of a field, as I said, when you place um, a mass or a charge within it. So um, let's have a look now, right, at point number two in our specification here. Right, so we, we'll call that one done for now. Uh, point number two, we're going to look at this formula here. Now, the first thing that, that Newton came up with is the idea that the, that the force is proportional to the mass or the product of the masses. Force is, you know, um, proportional to the product of masses. Now, that's important because if I think about uh, an object like the Earth, well, the Earth's got a very big mass, isn't it? And this feather, uh, I know this feather looks massive. I, I mean, maybe I should have made it smaller. There you go. It wasn't like a galactic feather or anything. It was meant to be a small feather. But the point is that that here, the feather is a very, very small mass. And in fact, even though the, the Earth has got an enormous mass, because the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses, Actually, there won't be very much force between these two objects at all. And as you know, you can quite easily defeat the gravitational force of the Earth, holding on a feather, by picking it up. In fact, you quite frequently are able to defeat the gravitational force of the Earth. Another feature about gravity is that it just happens to be a very, very weak force. Now, as well as that, the force of gravity is proportional to we call it inverse square law. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what we mean by an inverse square law, but suffice to say that if we double the distance from the Earth's gravitational field, then that will cause the force to go down by a factor of four, because if I am at a distance of 2r, 2r squared is really 4r, isn't it? So essentially, if I double the distance, um, the force goes down by a factor of four. And similarly, if I were to triple the distance, then you guessed it, gravitational force goes down by a factor of nine. So the Bayesian inverse square law, you would have come across a similar law when you did intensity, light intensity in year 10. So if you remember those lessons, you'll have seen that the light intensity again drops off with an inverse square law. They're quite common in physics. When we draw on a gravitational field, then you'll notice um, that um, this is a, a radial field. The reason why we call it a radial field is it seems to like radiate outwards or it's all conversion at the central point. The field lines that we've drawn here indicate a couple of things. Firstly, they indicate the strength of the field. Now you'll notice um, that the field lines say here close to the surface are closer than the field lines here. And the, the reason for that is, as I said, the field lines do diverge. But what that essentially means is that the, the, the field lines are showing you how strong the field is. So where the field lines are close together, we have a strong field. Where they're further apart, we have a weaker field. And also then you'll notice these arrows here, right? The arrows indicate the direction of the field. Now, when you do electric fields, you can have arrows which will point uh, outwards. Or you can have arrows that will 
point inwards. All right, and the the arrows on electric fields indicate the direction that a positive charge would move. In the case of gravity, it's only ever an attractive force. Gravity only ever pulls objects closer to another. Unlike uh, electrostatic forces, which can repel objects, two negative charges will repel and push each other away. Gravity is only ever attractive. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it causes a, a certain curvature of space time. That's what Einstein would say. Um, but as to why gravity is only uh, an attractive force, I'm not particularly sure. Um, maybe some smarter physicist might be able to tell you, but um, yeah, it only comes in one flavor. So uh, we'll, we'll say that we've uh, covered the fact that force is only attractive, or gravitational force is only attractive. Now, this gets a little bit trickier now. So now we're going to talk about um, this formula here, all right? We're going to talk about this, uh, this guy. So gravitational field strength. So if we define gravitational field strength at a point, we need to know certain things. Firstly, we need to know the mass of the object that's creating the gravitational field. You, you'll, you'll recognize that as the moon, I'm sure. We also need to know this distance here, okay? And I'm gonna label these as M1 and R1. You'll see why in a little bit, because one of the things about this topic can get a little bit tricky is the fact that you have M1, one mass and another mass. So you need to label them up as M1 or M2, or sometimes you might label them up as M, for the sun it might be like MS or M sun and ME for mass earth. And the notation is important because otherwise, as I say, you can get a little bit confused as to which mass you're talking about, and which distance you're talking about. Um, we don't use D. The reason we don't use D is because the gravitational field would be the same strength at any equal radius. So if arbitrarily I considered the strength of a gravitational field, say, at, oh, I don't know, 10 kilometers, then it would be the same strength at 10 kilometers in all directions. So instead of saying X or D, we will use the notation of R for the radius away from the center of that object. You'll notice I've drawn that here as well, and um, the distance from the center of that object. Oh, look at that now, I just lost my, there we go. The distance from the center of that object. And if we work that out then, um, the gravitational field strength then, just like with Newton's law, okay, is gonna be given by G is equal to, now big G, M1 over R squared. Right. Big G, M1 over R squared. Um, what is this G? Well, this is the gravitational constant. Um, and that's the constant that's the constant of proportionality that in some way tells us how strong gravity is. This is a very low value. It's um six point six seven times ten to the minus eleven now what that effectively means is is that gravity is a very weak force this is a fundamental constant of nature it's just it, it gives us a, a a feeling of how strong gravity is and that number is very very low it's one of the things that separates gravitational force apart from the strong force and the electromagnetic force and the weak force by virtue of the fact that it is so so low um, no, I didn't finish this off up here. I just realized now gravitational force, I should have finished off. Sorry, my bad. Can I just go back a second? F, then I didn't finish it off as the product, or I should say the gravitational constant times the product of two masses divided by R squared. So the force, force between two objects is given by that formula. Now you notice this one's very, very similar. Very, very similar. And if you think about it, um, as you already be aware previously, um, weight is, uh, is simply a force. Weight is simply a force. And if I think about comparing these two equations that we just looked at, we've got G, and um, this is the force equation now, M2 all over R squared. 
Then actually, look, if I take a different color here, here, this is little g. So what you've actually got here, if you, if you, if you look at it, if I just sort of take this out, you've got f, which is the same as weight, is equal to m2 g. Um, or I feel like you could say the gravitational force from um, mass one, which is g1, times the mass placed within that gravitational force, which is m2. So the formula W equals mg, I'm mad with the colors now, the formula W equals mg is really the same as this, right? They, they, are, they are one and the same. So um, that then is number four. Job done. Gravitational field strength at a point due to a mass. Right, moving on then. Um, next bit then is to look at um, point number five. The potential at a point due to um, a mass. And the work done in bringing the mass from infinity to that point. I'm going to jump in here and talk about gravitational potential energy now. So you will remember gravitational potential energy from key stage four as being equal to mgh, mass times gravity times height. Now, this is uh, fine close to Earth's surface. I wonder if you can think why reason is that, as we previously mentioned, the size of the gravitational force, so the gravitational field, sorry, or the magnitude of the gravitational field varies the distance away from the object. So if I'm talking about, oh, I don't know, how much gravitational potential energy, uh, how much is increased if I take a bag of sand from the bottom of a building to the top of a building, that's okay because the gravitational field strength is not going to vary very much from the bottom of a building to the top of a building. However, the gravitational field strength will change if we're talking about larger distance. So if I'm talking about putting a satellite into orbit, for example, then you've got the change in height. So you're working against that gravitational field. So you're doing work, you're gaining gravitational potential energy, but the strength of the gravitational field is also changing as well. So we've got to uh, appreciate that. Now, what we what we do then, all right, is we say that um, this is fine close to the Earth's surface, but for higher values of height or higher values of R, like we said previously, we need to we need to rethink what we're doing. So if you remember from if you remember from um, earlier on in the course for energy or work done, uh, work done is equal to force um, times distance. Oh, sorry, do you know what? I got that all backwards then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Force times distance. But we're going to say um, we're going to use R instead of X. And then what we're going to say is that gravitational potential energy then, GPE, is going to be equal to, well, we know what the force is, we know what gravitational force is, that's G, that's just Newton's law of, law of gravitation, M1, M2, all over R squared, times R. Now, one of those R's cancels with that, and we end up with G, M1, M2, over R. So this is our gravitational potential energy equation. That didn't go so good. The highlight is going really small for some reason. There we go. That'll do. So this is gravitational potential energy. So very, very similar formula to gravitational force. So you've got to watch out for that because um, the only difference is R and R squared and uh, it certainly catches a lot of students out. But that's not it, I'm afraid. 
Um, in fact, it looks a little bit different to that because I missed something out. Miss Sue has missed something out. If you look at uh, a formula booklet, you'll notice it's actually, um, sorry, actually GPE, gravitational potential energy, is equal to minus G M1 M2 over R squared. So what is this minus all about? Right, what is this minus sign all about? Uh, we need to try and explain that, don't we? Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go over here now. Good thing I've got plenty of room on, on this thing. Uh, I think, here we go. Um, now the minus sign, um, if we always, we always consider gravitational potential energy, um, always relevant, always relative to infinity. And the way to think about it is if I've got a, a mass M1 at, and let's say I'm, I've got a M2, um, let's say at this distance here, we're going to call this M2. The way to think about gravitational potential is how much energy would I need to add to it to move it from that point to infinity? And to move it away, work must be done. Okay, so to move M2 away, work must be done. And at infinity, at infinity, the gravitational potential energy is equal to zero. Okay, as R equals infinity. And you know, if you divide anything by infinity, then it goes to zero. So at infinity, where R is equal to infinity, then the gravitational potential energy is zero. So something that has no gravitational potential energy at that point. At that point. So the, the minus sign, okay, represents um, the amount of energy required amount of energy required to uh, move out of the field, essentially, move out of that field. That's it in basic terms, okay? You could say energy required to overcome that field and move out of that bound state. And the way to think about it is, is like this. Imagine if, I don't know, my value for gravitational potential energy was something like 10 megajoules, right? So if it was minus 10 megajoules at the surface, if I were to give an object 10 megajoules of energy, kinetic energy, then it would have only just enough energy to escape. And if it only had just enough energy to escape, then its overall kinetic energy after would, would be equal to zero. So think of it as the 10 megajoules, or the minus 10 megajoules is what you need to overcome in order to, to escape. But if you were to give something 10 megajoules, it would have no energy left over. It would essentially have zero energy um, at that distance as it approached infinity, infinity, okay? So that is why we have that negative sign. Um, now we're going to move on to the idea of potential, or gravitational potential. Now, gravitational potential um, is given by uh, Vg. Now, it's got the symbol V which uh, is a bit like potential difference, which you did uh, in terms of electricity. And it's, it's similar in a sense. We're looking at the potential difference um, between two points. But instead of having a V in terms of electric, we do a subscript G to denote the fact that we're talking about gravitational potential here. And that's equal to minus GM over R. Now, what this represents then, in terms of its unit of measurement, we know gravitational potential energy is just measured in joules. Gravitational potential then is joules 
per kilogram. And it represents the energy. So it's very similar. So energy per unit mass um, to move um, to move from a point to infinity. Similar. So if you think about gravitational potential energy, it could be like, okay, I've got this the space probe and I needed to leave the Earth's gravitational field. Okay, fine. How massive is that space probe? What's the gravitational potential energy in the surface? We can work out how much energy we need to get that space probe and beyond the gravitational field of the Earth, all right? Gravitational potential is slightly different in the sense that we are working out the gravitational or the amount of energy required for each kilogram of mass each kilogram of mass. So we're saying, look, how many joules of energy per kilogram is it going to cost us to move this object out of the Earth's gravitational field? Now, um, we, you will see um, in your notes and you will see often in the exam questions um, something, called, something called lines of equi equipotential. And the lines of equipotential are often actually dotted I've started now, let me finish it. Often like da dashed lines. And what these represent are lines um, which are, oh, if you like, almost imaginary surfaces, which all have the same potential energy. You'll notice here that the one closest to the Earth's surface has got a, a potential of um, minus five times 10 to the seven joules per kilogram. And then the further we go out, the lower it gets. Now, you might, for example, uh, need to work out the potential between two points, or you might want to work out how much energy it's going to take to move maybe a satellite between two different gravitational potentials. I'll give you an example. Um, the International Space Station, it's orbit degrades over time so it's not true that it's actually in just a pure vacuum of space there are the odd um rogue air particles around which collide with the space station even 400 kilometers up and over time that small amount of um, friction reduces the kinetic energy and velocity of the international space station and its orbit decreases and when they have resupply missions or they swap astronauts, they will very often put that satellite back up into a higher orbit. And to do that, they have to do this physics. They have to think about how many joules of energy it's going to take per kilogram of mass to move between two equipotential surfaces to change that height effectively. So if I knew, for example, that Oh, I don't know, the International Space Station, how much does that weigh? I haven't got a clue. Um, no, I don't know. I'm going to go for a ballpark figure. It's got to be, I don't know, let's say if it weighs eight tons. I'm going to be embarrassed later on when I look this up, I'm sure. Then you know if it's 8,000 kilograms, then to go from, um, if you like, this surface to this surface, it's going to cost you 8,000 joules, or 8,000, sorry, times 10 to the 7 because every kilogram of mass mass costs you to move between those two the potential difference is one um one times 10 to the 7 joules per kilogram so it's one times 10 to the 7 times 8,000 will give you the amount of energy you need to move between those two surfaces so then you can work out things like how much fuel will we need to move um the space station up between these two surfaces have we got enough fuel you know it's, it's, it's crazy anyway all right um, so let's have a look at a couple of examples then, all right? Uh, first example then, um, gravitational potential energy. So calculate the gravitational potential energy of Voyager 2 at the Earth's surface, given that its mass is 815 uh, kilograms and it's, the mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Now RE, that stands for the radius 
of the surface of the Earth is 6,400 6, kilometers. I should also mention that sometimes these things are donated, uh, annotated rather, sorry, um, by capital R. Capital R is often used to represent the distance to the surface. So if this is asking me to work out the potential energy, then I would do GPE, which formula is it? Be careful. So this is going to be minus um, G, oops, uh, M1, M2, all over R squared. That's equal to minus 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times, oops, so it's got that wrong there. See, I did exactly what I said not to do. Did you all spot that? I did that on purpose. Totally did that on purpose. Okay, um, so that's going to be mass one. We'll say that's the Earth. Six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Big boy. Times 815 all over the radius. And that is going to be 6,400. But be careful kilometers isn't it so it's times 10 to the 3. If you do all that uh, what you end up with is a, a value of minus 5.1 times 10 to the 10 joules. So that's how much energy you need to spend to get Voyager 2 that space probe launched all that time ago 42 years ago in fact um, to get it beyond the Earth's gravitational field. That's how much energy you need to spend, OK? And um, it's very, it's worth looking it up. Um, Voyager 2 is still actually sending information back to us. It was um, only meant to last a few years. And um, here we are 42 years later, 42, mind. I'm 40, so just wrap your head around that. Um, it's still sending data back and it's gone to the edge of our solar system and it's into it interstellar, interstellar space now, which is quite an incredible achievement. 11 billion miles away. Right. So um, that's how you calculate gravitational potential. Let's just do uh, one more example then where we now calculate gravitational potential. So I've said, what is the gravitational potential of a geostationary orbit? 38,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So when we talk about gravitational potential, we do V little g, and that's equal to minus g m1 over r not r squared, just r, and just one of the m's. And if we work that out, um, we'd be doing, again, gravitational constant. So that's minus 6.67 times 10 to the uh, minus 11 times 6 times 10 to the 24 um, times, uh, well, hang on now, assuming mistake. No, that's fine. Uh, and the Earth's surface divided by uh, now this is where you've got to be careful because um, the radius is not necessarily what you might first think. You've got to remember that gravitational potential, gravitational potential energy gravitational force is considered from the center of the objects. So I said in this 38,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and we already know that the Earth's surface is 6,400 6, kilometers from the center of the Earth. So we could add 6,400 kilometers to 38,000 times 10 to the three for the fact that it's kilometers. If you do all that, you end up with minus nine, one zero times ten to the six. That's supposed to be a ten. I do apologize. Um, ten to the six joules per kilogram. Again, look at that unit. It's nine. Uh, nine times ten. Yeah, so it's it's nine million joules of energy for every kilogram of mass. So that is the gravitational potential of a geostationary orbit. And geostationary orbits, you know, they're very far out there. Um, so it takes a, a lot of energy to put a satellite. I'm that far away. OK, nearly, nearly there. For the last thing then, uh, on a, uh, well, I should also mention then that you can convert actually between gravitational potential energy. You'll notice these things are very similar. So um, GPE is equal to 
M times delta V G, right? Um, in, in very many ways, that's very similar to um, W is equal to Q V, but you already noticed that, I'm sure. Um, and then uh, finally, then gravitational potential. If I go back to my specification, I should really just check in with this. So we've done uh, this, we've done this, this. Change in potential energy. Yeah, we just did that. Um, and then finally, we're looking at field strength of the point is given by G, so the slope, of the graph. So if I have a graph of uh, V, sorry, I do apologize, against R, I can expect it to look like this. Um, remember, it's large and negative to begin with. So close to the surface, or at the surface, and I'm using big R here, it's large and negative gravitational potential. And as we go away, it decreases in its magnitude by your inverse square law. And all that last bit means is if I was to draw tangent at this point, then the gradient of this line, okay, the grad, that grad be equal to G, okay? the gravitational field strength. That's all that means. Right, now we've got 10 minutes left. Let's do a couple of past papers nice and quick, unless there are any like questions or anything like that, and I'm sure. And so we will jump in and tell me if there are, but um, a good use of our time might be just to look at um, a couple of these. So, um, the escape velocity V of a mass M from a spherical mass M and radius R can be calculated using now, escape velocity just means, you know, the speed at which something needs to move in order to escape a gravitational field. Theoretically, there is a speed at which I can fire a cannon, for example, straight up. And if I give that shell or that cannonball enough velocity, then theoretically it will have enough kinetic energy to leave the Earth, Earth's gravitational field entirely. You think about it, if I fire it with a certain speed, it'll go up so far and then fall back down. But if I fire it with enough speed, there'll be a point where it just leaves, it gets further and further away, it's keep on slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, but it ultimately escapes. That's what we call the escape velocity. Now, in the special case where we give it exactly the right amount of energy to leave the Earth's gravitational field and no more, we have um, an interesting conservation of energy problem. So here we have got um, half mv squared uh, is equal to g m m over r. Now I'm going to put that as, sorry, big R. That's right, put it as big R. Just change the size of this pen a little. So essentially all I've done is rearrange the equation and all I'm saying here is that if the kinetic energy then um, is equal to the GPE at surface, um, then if you could say that the mass will have exactly enough energy to um, escape. And maybe I'll just add on the end there, Ke would equal to zero at infinity. Nice. Calculate the escape velocity from the sun then, um, given that data. Well, we can just use that formula here. We can say, right, well, half mv squared is equal to g m m over r. Now, the little m's cancel. So that's the mass of the object. And again, that look, the equations are trying to tell you something. Listen to them. They're trying to talk to you. What that's saying is it doesn't matter whether they have a five kilogram mass or a 50 kilogram mass, um, the escape velocity will still be the same. It's completely independent of the size of the object that you're trying to um, get rid of. The speed of it is, um, is, is constant for all masses. So then if you um, rearrange this, you end up with V is equal to the square root of 2GM over R. And I'm gonna skip this one, right? By putting the just get, go straight to the answer so we can get through some more content. Okay, 
and that comes out with 618 meters per second. These are all of the new specification as well, right? So if I've spoiled any mock exams for anyone, then I do apologize. And I'll spoil it for you, maybe for your teachers. <laughs> and then, um, oh, temperature, the surface of the sun, kinetic theory to show that the RMS speed of a free electron on the surface of the sun is approximately 500 kilometers per second. It's a different topic, it's unit three, but I'll just leave you with this, which you will remember, I'm sure, that is a freebie. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Five minutes left. Okay, let's. Uh, uh, well, well, we'll forget that one actually as well. Okay. Um, so this next one here, then the variation in gravitational potential near Pluto is shown by the graph. We looked at one of these just now. I sketched an awful one for you. Assuming that the potential at the surface is correct, so we'll assume that there we are. The potential at the surface R. We'll assume that this is correct. Um, confirm that the potential of 3R is plotted correctly. So what I'd say here is, well, I remember tonight that V is equal to minus G M over R. And I also know that if I sort of rearrange that, then what that means is that V times R is equal to minus G M. Check this out. What that means is um, that V times R is a constant. So any value of V, potential times any value of r radius or distance from the surface will always equal some constant because g and m are constant and therefore minus 0.72 if i just check the numbers in i got that 0.72 from from here okay minus 0.72 times 10 to the 6 um, times r is equal to 0.24 now that's up here. I got that from here. Look, right? 0.24. Look, is uh, yes, there. Is that right? No, it's the one above. Sorry, that one there. 0.24 times 10 to the 6 times 3r. Because if you look at the graph, you see it's at a distance of 3r. And when you think about it now, if you do, um, if you look at this, then it's exactly the same value, isn't it? All right. Because 3 times 0.2 is 0.72 times 10 to the 6. So you've got less potential, three times the distance away, and what you confirm there is that both equal that same constant, so you're fine. Um, right, calculate the gravitational potential energy of a spacecraft of mass 600 kilograms at rest on the surface. So gravitational potential energy, GPE, um, is equal to, do you remember this one we did? Um, uh, we did uh, M delta VG. Um, now this means then, oh sorry, put a minus in there as well. Uh, we've got 0 0.72 times 10 to the 6 times 600. Remember now, this is the amount of energy required per kilogram of mass. 0 0.72 times 10 to the 6 joules of energy per kilogram of mass. We've got 600 kilograms. So we can work out the potential energy then because it's just 600 times larger. Um, so that's 4.32 times 10 to the 8 joules. All right. And then. Uh, there we go. OK, um, I tell you what. Uh, I think it's probably best that we leave this there. Um, there is another question which is very similar to the first when we looked at about escape velocity. So we'll uh, maybe just have a moment to have a see if there are any questions. Um, but um, I don't know if there are uh, no. any questions. No, no questions here. That can only mean that I've explained it so well <laughs> that, you know, it's it's just that clear for everyone. Um, so, yeah, we have gone through gravitational fields. We have looked at um, have gravitational field strength. We've looked at how that varies with radius. We've looked at gravitational potential energy, not to be confused with gravitational potential. And um, we've done a few questions along the way. Now, um, in, in subsequent sessions, we'll probably look at um, orbits potentially. Um, not enough time to get that far with it today, but um, I hope the session's been useful. And um, yeah, if there are any questions, then please feel free to put them in the, the chat. But aside from that, I've been Mr. Red. 
Um, thank you to Mrs. Owen and um, goodbye all.